This is quite possibly the most powerful yet portable full frame camera you can currently buy. I'm talking of course about the Sony A7CR, which Sony were kind enough to loan to me for a few weeks to try out. Now I'm going to go ahead and start this video by saying that this is quite possibly one of the most impressive cameras I have ever tested. But unfortunately, like most things in life, nothing is 100% perfect. And there are certainly a few characteristics about this camera that may mean it's not the right choice for you. So even if you are remotely considering buying this camera, then definitely stick around because you're going to want to hear me out on this one before parting ways with your cash. Okay, so let's start with one of the main reasons why you probably even think about buying this camera in the first place, and that's its small form factor. Just like the original a7C, this is an APS-C sized camera, but with all the benefits of having a larger full frame sensor. Now, we'll obviously go into more detail about the sensor a little bit later on in the video, but you may have noticed that I used air quotes when describing this camera as being APS-C sized, and that's because technically it, it is. It's roughly the same size as the Sony a6700, but I do feel like that description could be a touch misleading. Now, although this camera is certainly smaller and lighter than my normal full frame camera, which is the Sony a7 Mark IV, on closer inspection, honestly, the difference isn't as great as you might think. As you can see, the a7CR body is just as deep as the a7 Mark IV, albeit for the slightly shallower hand grip. It's also only about two centimeters or three quarters of an inch shorter in the width. And height wise, it's only really the top mounted EVF that makes the a7 Mark IV about three centimeters or just over an inch taller. What's more, all of this translates into just a 150 gram weight difference between the two cameras. Okay, just pause for one minute. So, hi. Tom from the future here. It just occurred to me whilst I was editing this video that some of you might be wondering at this point, why am I comparing this A7CR to the A7 Mark IV? Shouldn't I instead be comparing this to the A7R5? Because this is just a smaller version of that, right? Well, it's a little bit complicated, but yes and also no, because actually there are a lot of features which this camera doesn't include from its bigger brother. And on paper, this camera is actually more closely matched to the A7 Mark IV, with the biggest difference being that this has the latest AI-driven AF features and also that big boy 60 megapixel sensor. Now, if you do want to see a 60 second rundown on the differences between this and the A7R Mark V, then I've already made a short video on it here, which you can check out. But hopefully for the meantime, that clears up any confusion. Okay, back to the video. I decided to take this camera away with me on a weekend break to Krakow in Poland. So I wanted to keep this as small and lightweight as humanly possible. So that meant I was predominantly shooting with this Sony 40 millimeter F2.5. Although it's not quite a pancake lens, it's still way smaller and lighter than my faster lenses like this Sony 35mm f1.4 G Master, which once attached to this camera increases the size and weight dramatically and makes the whole setup feel way more front heavy. Now, don't get me wrong here because I'm not saying that, you know, the difference in size and weight just makes no difference whatsoever because even just shaving off a few grams here and there makes a big difference, particularly if you like to travel as light as possible. But I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that although the A7C R is certainly smaller and lighter than most other full frame options. If you're not going to use it with smaller and lighter glass, then the few grams you do save by buying this body probably aren't going to make a huge amount of difference. However, the reduced size has come at the cost of it not including a joystick, which is something that I personally rely on quite a lot when it comes to using my A7 Mark IV, mainly as a way of quickly adjusting the position of the AF point. So this is something I did have to adapt to, but luckily there are plenty of workarounds. The first one is to hit the center button in the d-pad and then just use the d-pad to move around the af point i'll be totally honest and say that this was by far my least favorite method because not only is it just way slower than a joystick because you can't make diagonal movements but also i would often think i'd depress the middle button when in actual fact i hadn't and then i would just end up altering other camera settings instead so the other option is to use the touchscreen which actually is a lot quicker than a joystick because the change is instant though my favorite method was just setting the af on button to af track this way i could just hover the af point over the subject, press and hold the AF on button, and so long as I kept this button depressed, the camera would track the subject around the frame. I found this particularly handy if I was walking towards someone, for instance, and I just wanted to take a quick snap of them because all I needed to do was lock in the focus from a distance and then bring the camera down to my waist height, which meant I was way more discreet, and then just rattle off a few more shots as they got closer. And by and large, the camera did an amazing job of keeping focus locked onto the target. Now, all of that said, I do want to go ahead and say that I think Sony has really gotten a lot of things right with the design of this 
this camera. Despite its smaller frame, they've still managed to squeeze on three proper control dials, well four technically if you count the one that doubles as the D-pad, and ultimately this means that it has the same level of control and style of handling as the other larger full frame cameras. This new switch around the mode dial does make it super quick and easy to toggle between photo and video modes, and the tiltable flip out screen is an absolute dream for street photography, particularly if you're like me and you like to shoot from the hip in order to be more discreet. But by far my favourite feature about this camera, and one of the main reasons why I think it's just so good, especially in the context of travel and street photography, is the sensor. Obviously this is one of Sony's top tier imaging sensors, so it's kind of to be expected that the colours and dynamic range are just amazing, so I won't go into too much detail there, but that's not the reason why I love this sensor anyway. As I mentioned earlier, for my trip I wanted to make this setup as light as possible, so I took a bit of a gamble and I only took this 40mm lens with me. But naturally no focal length can do absolutely everything, so there were a handful of times where I would spot a shot in a distance and just know I wasn't going to make it in time in order to capture it. Now usually that would just result in me accepting my fate and that I'd missed the shot and I'd quickly move on to something else, but with this camera, because it has a 60 megapixel sensor, all I did was took the shot anyway, knowing full well it was shot way too wide for the composition that I actually wanted, however I knew that I could crop it in in Lightroom later. Because when you've got 60 megapixels of resolution to play around with, even in situations where I had to make pretty extreme crops, I was still left with a photo that was between 20 and 30 megapixels, which is plenty big enough for posting online or making prints. With my Sony a7 Mark IV, which captures 33 megapixel images, I would just never dream of making such extreme crops like this, and had I taken this camera with me instead of the a7CR, I'm almost certain I would have missed a bunch of these opportunities. Or, you know, at the very least, I would have been forced into taking a larger zoom lens with me, or even multiple primes, but honestly, the idea of lugging around a heavy bag full of equipment all day just wasn't something I was willing to entertain, especially on a weekend off. However, there are some pretty obvious drawbacks to capturing 60 megapixel raw images, the first being the dramatically increased file sizes. Now, I should preface this section by saying there are varying levels of compression available in the camera to help control the raw file sizes, and I did opt for the standard compressed option so that the files were pretty much as small as possible, but still, on average, the photos I took were somewhere between 60 and 70 megabytes each. Now, I've got a pretty high-spec gaming PC, and normally I can blast through photo edits without too much of a problem, but when editing these 60 megapixel images, it did end up taking noticeably longer as I spent more time waiting for the preview window to catch up to my slider adjustments. Don't get me wrong, nothing of what I've just said I think is a total deal breaker, but it's definitely something that I completely overlooked and didn't appreciate until I started handling file types of this size, so it might be something that you need to bear in mind if you are planning on capturing large quantities of RAW files with this camera. Also, whilst we're on the topic of storage, this camera only has one UHS-2 SD card slot, so again, if you are shooting high quantities of RAW files, you will need to invest in higher capacity SD cards to avoid having to keep swapping in and out cards all of the time. One final thing to touch on, which I didn't even think about about was the mechanical shutter speed on this camera it maxes out at 1 4,000th of a second, whereas other larger full-frame cameras like the a7 Mark IV or the a7R Mark V can go up to 1 8,000th of a second. Now, for most situations, this probably won't make one bit of difference. However, if you are like me and you like to take portraits outside with fast prime lenses, particularly on sunny days, then you will quickly hit this shutter speed ceiling, so that may mean you need to think about bringing along an ND filter with you. Now, you can get around that issue slightly by using the electronic shutter, because that will allow you to go up to 1 8,000th of a second. However, there are a number of issues that can come along with using an electronic shutter, including that rolling shutter or warping effect. So personally, I just tend to avoid using the electronic shutter altogether unless I really do need to. So going back to what I said at the beginning of the video, I do think this is one of the most impressive cameras I have ever tested. But I also think the biggest irony about this camera is that all of the things that make it just so good are also the things that provide drawbacks, which ultimately makes it a a really hard camera to recommend buying, especially for $3,000. Now, if money was no object to you and you were after a camera that offers the best balance of power and portability, I am honestly struggling to think of another camera that really could compete with this. For street and travel photography in particular, when paired with the right lenses, this is an absolute dream. But in the real world, the majority of us have to think carefully about how we spend our money, and honestly, there are just way more sensible options to consider. The most glaringly obvious one ironically, is its sibling, the A7C Mark II, which at the time of recording is around $800 cheaper and has the vast majority of the same specs and features as the A7CR, albeit with a lower resolution 33 megapixel sensor. But we'll save that one for another time.